Today, I'm going to real quickly go through a presentation. I do a fair amount that just says, here's what the bulletin is. This is just for people who don't aren't familiar with it or don't know the history. Some of it's pretty interesting. And then I'm going to go into how can the bulletin and how can I help you, help you be better reporters, help you do better stories. So uh, I will try to complete all that in like, half hour max, so we can just talk. I'm, I'm actually going to probably do it a little shorter than that. And I have been told many times in the past that I have a soft voice. So if my voice drops and you, you aren't hearing me, just raise a little finger and I'll speak louder, but I'll try to speak up through the whole thing. Okay, this, this was the original Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which was founded in December 1945 by a bunch of Manhattan Project scientists who had scared themselves by making atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even though some of them didn't really want that to happen. And the original publication they created, as you can see, was called Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists of Chicago. And it was all of a, like a six-page mimeographed thing, you know, and it's hard to even call it a magazine. Uh, it was started as a part of the emergency action that Albert Einstein was involved in. Uh, this is a famous quote of his about a new type of thinking being essential for mankind to survive. That's sort of a mantra for the bulletin that we're trying to foster a new kind of thinking about existential threats and this being the first of the nuclear weapons. Uh, here you see this, the emergency committee that was in on raising the money to found the bulletin. And the only reason I throw this up here is, well, it looks kind of cute and old timey, but also from the very start, number six, what the scientists wanted to manage nuclear weapons being as dangerous as they are was international control. And that effort to actually put it, the United Nations, something where no one country had control of nuclear energy or nuclear weapons, uh, failed. But that was the focus of the early atomic scientists. Uh, at some time, you know, magazines were the big media thing back then. And in 1947, the scientists decided, you know, in order to spread real information, we need to modernize this. We need to be a magazine to be cool like the other big magazines. And they had no idea how to make a magazine, but they knew they needed a cover. Okay, so they, one of the uh, scientists or engineers, I can't remember, had a wife named Martia Langsdorf. And they asked her to come up with a cover. And she came up with two or three possibles, but they eventually settled on this, a clock ticking down to midnight as the cover of the magazine. People always ask me, why is the hand at seven minutes till midnight? It's because Martiel, as she went, she was one of those one-named artists, Martiel said, it's because that looks good to me. So this doomsday clock that you know of now originally didn't move. For two years, this was the cover of the bulletin. And then in 1949, the then editor Eugene Rabinowitch uh, had a brainstorm when the Soviet Union set off its first nuclear weapon, atomic bomb, which was a huge, it came much earlier than US officials thought it would, and it was a huge thing. Then he just decided to move the hand of the clock. And there was such a reaction to that that the doomsday clock became a thing in the hand regularly moved. For most of the time, it was whatever the editor, Eugene Rabinowitch, decided it would be. He moved it to the previously the closest, I think it was two minutes to midnight, in 1953 when Russia set off its first uh, thermonuclear weapon, a hydrogen bomb. Uh, but through time, th the bulletin, from its start, it was focused on nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. But it always had this sort of notion that 
Well, that was just the first existential threat to come out of what they called the Pandora's box of modern science. There would be others. And so as over time, they started trying to broaden the scope of the publication. And you can see it in the covers of the magazine. The magazine for a while became a bulletin, a journal of science and public affairs, and the clock got really small. You know, it wasn't the focus anymore. And then in the 70s, they had no idea what they were going to call this thing. I mean, it's the world's longest magazine title. Science and Public Affairs, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist. Uh, I don't think that lasted very long. Uh, but in this trend of covering more and more existential threats, Climate came in for the coverage of the bulletin fairly early. This is, uh, I think, February 1978. The bulletin had its first climate change cover, which is decades before most other media even knew this was a possibility. Um, by the 90s, the bulletin had become a fully modern print magazine, and some of them are just beautiful. It was a print magazine, and it was kind of big, and uh, really a good magazine. Good enough, in fact, in 2007, it won a National Magazine Award for General Excellence, which is sort of like winning the Oscars or a Pulitzer or something in magazine land. The Pulitzers now cover magazines too, so it's a little different now, but still winning a National Magazine Award in that category is a big deal. And of course, since all good deeds go punished. Immediately upon winning the National Magazine Award, financial problems caused the bulletin, financial and other reasons, but they killed the print edition of the magazine. Went all digital, early, earlier than most other publications. And this is what, this was the new website when I joined the bulletin in I think 2011 and a couple years later they launched this new website, which, you know, was okay, but in a few years ago, three, four years ago, maybe five now, we launched a fully modern WordPress, uh, really, really well done website that has been sort of an engine for us to grow the bulletin's reach, its impact, its look, to make it a fully modern, multi-platform, uh, existential threat publication. Uh, this is just me bragging. You can you know, close your eyes and tell me to go on if you want. But this is seven years were 10 times bigger in terms of uh, reach for the magazine. Uh, and I'll take that. It's not quite a dot-com J curve for growth of audience, but it's close enough for me. Uh, it's also, strangely, if you think of, I've been telling you about this magazine that started in 1945, so you'd think it's your grandpa's magazine or something, but actually the audience is incredibly young. It's roughly 70%, 44 and younger, which is, you know, most advertising kind of people will tell you that's a perfect, I mean, that's a demographic most people kill for. And it's entirely because we started being, you know, a digital publication a little earlier than other people, but essentially grew the audience from nothing so that what we have is sort of a reflection of the modern internet audience, which is great for us because it's really good. Uh, over time, that cover I showed you of the doomsday clock with you know, full page cover has gone on and the doomsday clock. Every January now we hold a press conference that's usually at the National Press Club in Washington and it has a variety of different, you know, semi-celebrity in this realm kind of people speaking and the response to that is, and I don't, it's not me, this is the doomsday clock is some kind of magic. Somebody dropped magic from the sky when they created this thing because 
it is just beloved. Even though it scares people silly, it is something that every year, like I've, I've written here, this time around, 12,000 media pieces were written, published, within a month of the Doomsday Clock announcement. Uh, it's hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of readers all at once. And it's a, a wonderful thing to have one time a year when, I mean, you all know you, you try to cover nuclear weapons, and we've sort of alluded to it's sometimes kind of diff difficult to get your editors to think, well, that's, that's the big story we should cover today. And this gives, in a sense, permission for people to write stories about that. And their editors can't say no because the Doomsday Clock just made an announcement, so it's okay. You know, it's okay to write about this for the next month or two. We're also branching out. We now cover four, as they say in the business, verticals, four types of existential threats, nuclear, climate, we call it biosecurity, uh, and disruptive threats, including, as you've been reading of late, artificial intelligence. So as we're expanding what we're offering to the public, which includes a lot more multimedia, you know, the uh, infographics, mapping, you know, all of that database mapping, that kind of thing. We're also getting into some meetings, conferences, whatever. We just held a giant uh, conference on biolab safety in Geneva, Switzerland, that was attended by a lot of the major figures in biosecurity. And I think given the controversy over, well, how did COVID-19 start was a really useful exercise. Um, that's kind of what it looked like. Uh, we've got a lot of partnerships, and this is one that we hope to continue here with Atomic Reporters. We hope that this is something that you listen to me and you don't think I'm an idiot, and that from now on, you all can use me and the bulletin as a resource to help you do better work because we don't view it as a competition. We don't need to compete with you all. We want you all to do more. Uh, so that this is one of our partnerships with Climate Desk. It's 15 or 20 major magazines that we all swap climate stories. And I know that uh, Rob Elder has some interest in you know, doing something of this sort with nuclear, and maybe that will arise out of some of this. Uh, we're also going to add more art. Basically, I just threw this in because I thought it was funny. Uh, um, and I've already talked about that, except for the picture of Vladimir Putin with a wire coming out of his ear. That's, that's worth looking at. Uh, another way to look at what the bulletin is today is it's about these areas of existential threat and how they intersect. And they do intersect. And that is one way you can get your editors interested in this. Obviously, nuclear energy, as you told me all last night, intersects with climate, right? And artificial intelligence intersects in all sorts of ways with nuclear weapons, command and control, it intersects with cyber security. So these threats intersect with one another. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're trying to sell your editors on just a nuclear story. Maybe you can get one that covers a couple of things that they hadn't thought of and get you, you know, good play on it. Uh, the bulletin does its, the main chunk of what we publish is by academic policy scientific experts that my editors and I, that's our job is to turn what they write, which sometimes is brilliant and sometimes is written exactly the way you would think a nuclear physicist would write. And our job is to turn it into, you know, as close as we can get to really good magazine journalism. 
and I think we do that, but the, still 70% of the bulletin is going to come from experts. But we are expanding. We are doing more long-form journalist written pieces. I am working to get funding, Mr. Elder, to commission more of these uh, stories, particularly nuclear stories. And, you know, those of you who are freelance in here, I hope we can gather together some money over the next year or so to be commissioning ambitious nuclear stories and partnering with NPR on stories and, you know, doing things that can help get this vital information to a huge general audience so that, as in our lingo, our theory of change is, you get a big enough audience and the leaders have to follow. They have to do it. So that's your job. That's what I view my job as. And now that's the end of the first part of my presentation. And so now we have the quiz. Who, who said we want to be read in the White House, at the Kremlin, and around the kitchen table? Jerry Brown. You know, good guess. You know, I actually thought somebody said this before, and I, I guess I just made it up. But it's, it is now the, one of the mantras of the bulletin. We want top-level readers, leaders to read us, but also an increasingly large general audience because we think leaders do listen when you do journalism that's important enough and reaches enough people. They just do. I've seen it. I've seen, well, the doomsday clock announcement this year. The UN Secretary General got up and gave his opening speech in January by citing the doomsday clock. So it can have impact. Um, this is me, and I'm going to share this deck with, I don't know how or where, but it will be up somewhere so you all can know how to get a hold of me. Uh, one of the things that you get because you came to this is personal access to me. Uh, you can email me anytime with questions, whatever. Like I said, for us, it's not a competition. If you need help, if you need to know what experts, you know, I am glad to help. There's also John Pope, who's our chief audience officer, who's been around the nuclear sphere and knows everybody who's anybody. He can help also. Uh, we have on our science and security board, which you'll find on our website, just click the little hamburger at the top left, and you'll see we, the bulletin has a million boards. Find the science and security board, and there will be, you know, in addition, John Wolfsall is on our Science and Security Board. You all heard from him. But there's four or five others on our board who are equally, I mean, people who have served at high levels in the executive branch, people who really know their stuff. So, you know, if you're like, oh, you need, you know, somebody who isn't just going to spout the government line, who can sort of, whether on the record, off the record, whatever, give you what's going on here. That's, you know, if I were in your shoes, you know, you being a brand new reporter, you know, gosh, who do I call about this? You know, I'd go look at the Science and Security Board and see about some of those people. Uh, also, as Pink has told you all, you know, hey, you know, backgrounding so you don't sound like, you know, an idiot when you start questioning sources and important people and whatever. Being backgrounded is important. And if you, you can just go and our top navigation, you know, nuclear risk. You click on that, it just pulls up our nuclear risk coverage going backward in time from now till, you know, ages ago. So you can go in and read back at the bulletin the last two, three, four, five months, actually fairly quickly, at least scan and see what we've covered. And there's a lot of stuff in there that, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm bragging, but you all don't know it. There's a lot of stuff in there that you read back in there for two or three or four months. I'd be surprised if most of you didn't come up with a story idea or two. Really. I mean, we've 
frequently because of the Science and Security Board knowing their fields so well, they keep us ahead of most media in, in these realms. You know, uh, we've been publishing Alan here on Nuclear Winter since when, Alan? 20, 30 years ago? I mean, it's, it's quite a while. It's a while ago. The, yeah. the article on self, Selfish Your Destruction was published in both. Seven years ago, before that, too. Yeah. yeah, you know, so, you know, that again, you know, I mean, y'all are going to read all sorts of stuff, but that's an easy way to, you know, just make sure you're, you know, what the bulletin, we have a twice a week newsletter. It's easy to sign up to, it's free. You get most of our coverage. It's come in your email inbox, uh, and the website is free. I mean, we have a Buy monthly magazine that's subscription also, but if you see something in the magazine that you think is relevant to something you need, all you got to do is email me, and I will send you the copy of it. We will get you it to you. Yeah. We had this paper on uh, in Nature Food last year about AM and after nuclear war. You did a nice multimedia expansion of it, with nice images and stuff, so it was much easier to understand the original article. That was good. Yeah, thanks. I hope I hope we make them better. Well, at least I think most of the time we do. Uh, okay, that's how the bulletin specifically might be of help. And I should have prefaced all this. You all, some of you are extremely experienced journalists. And I, I can't, it's hard for me to know where to peg what I'm saying. So if what I'm saying is too elementary or it seems like I'm, you know, talking down or something, you know, I'm sorry, it's not that. It's just there's an array of different levels here. Uh, but I think in general, and this is a vast generality, but the Northeast, the Washington reporting on in national and international security relies a lot on government officials and the think tanks that are in Washington. And sometimes to get balance, to see if you're on the right track, to question, is what the government's saying right? You might think about, you know, outside the Beltway, think tanks, CSAC at Stanford, we have a couple of those people on our science and security board, but CSAC has a lot of excellent nuclear people. I mean, you already heard from Sig Hecker, who's on, who's our uh, chair of our board of sponsors is affiliated with CSAC, but there's several others. It's a really wonderfully helpful place if you aren't aware of it. Princeton's program on global security, Zia Mielin. And again, we have some people on our science and security board out of Princeton, but they are very, very helpful and deeply knowledgeable. Most of you probably know about the Belfer Center at the Kennedy School at Harvard, but if you don't, uh, Fran Francesca Giovannini, who runs the Managing the Atom project there, is, again, fantastically helpful and will get you. You want to know about X, she'll get the, you the experts to tell you about X. Uh, and then I have to mention the University of Chicago because that's where the bulletin's based. It has some fairly decent nuclear people there and climate too. And again, as, as in terms of checking yourself, there are European think tanks that American media fairly seldom seems to be dealing with. And because the bulletin's an international kind of publication, I sort of got forced to confront, you know, dealing with these uh, European think tanks. And that's something to think about, at least, is, is maybe getting, you know, some of these things, you know, the European view on Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats, in some regards, in some countries, is different than the American view. Uh, yes? Just anyone in particular? Uh, there's a guy named Oliver Meyer, and I'm M E I E R, and he just moved. He's at a German think tank. Um, actually, he moved to the European Leadership Network. So he's at ENN and. Oh, okay, okay. There you go. There's one of them. 
Uh, and I'm blanking right now, but th there are others, and I will put them up on this slide deck when I post it, so you can just see there. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, this is like a cliche of the highest order. Question the common wisdom. But there are some specific questions about nuclear weapons that within governments and even within the alphabet soup of nonprofits and whatever that deal with nuclear stuff, it's often without thinking the idea more nuclear weapons equates to more security. Right now, I mean, they're talking about modernizing the U.S. nuclear arsenal and building more uh, plutonium pits, you know, building more nuclear warheads when we have thousands upon thousands we could destroy the earth many times over. Why would more make you safer? Why would China building more make China safer? What's really going on here? Is it really about security? Uh, missile defense has been one of the most monumental failures over time. It's recently for some shorter range, more like rocket defense, the technology has advanced enough to be a little bit better. But there are a million stories in, you know, missile defense costing billions upon billions upon billions of dollars and not working. And because the United States got out of the ABM treaty, and that's all collapsed, U.S. missile defense is causing Russia and China to modernize and increase their arsenals. There's this tie together of missile defense fueling arms races, even though it doesn't work. And that's, you know, that sort of eternally fascinating to me. You've got to find new angles, things like that. I understand, but it's a, it's a real story. The, story that people connected to the bulletin regularly say, our experts, that the land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles of the United States are really kind of anachronisms and are almost anti-security and that they could be given up and we'd be safer. And that gets just about zero play, you know, because inside the Beltway, you will get the answer, oh, poo 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 but it's not poo poo. It is, you know, former Secretary of Defense. It's like real people who have really looked at this saying, those missiles, because they have to be launched on warning, essentially, on warning of attack, or they'd be blown up in their silos, they are instruments of instability. They make us less safe. So I'm not advocating that we need to get rid of them necessarily, but a discussion about that is completely in order since we're building a hundred billion dollar brand new ICBMs. That ought to at least be discussed. Uh, I'd already mentioned the plutonium pits. We're building you know, on this program of here at Los Alamos and in South Carolina they're going to start building I forget what it is now, 60, 70, 90 plutonium pits, the centers for thermonuclear warheads every year. Now we have thousands of nuclear warheads and we have high level studies by the Defense Department's own experts that say those warheads will last 100 years. But we're going to build new ones costing huge amounts of money for what? And again, I'm not saying, well, I, I understand, you know, there are arguments for why you might do some of them and whatever. And so I'm not saying be one-sided or whatever. I'm just saying under my commonplace question the common wisdom, there's some specific things that really need to be questioned. Uh, and just as an example, Recently, and this isn't so much nuclear weapons, although it is, recently the 
Energy Department announced this huge breakthrough in nuclear fusion. They used what they call the NIF, the nu Nuclear uh, Ignition Facility. It's like hundreds of giant lasers pointed at a little packet of hydrogen you know, isotopes to make a flash of energy, to make fusion happen for really short. And Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Granholm, the Energy Secretary, gave a press conference where this was announced as a breakthrough in clean energy production. And it was going to be used in the fight against climate change. And that's what the, the whole press conference aimed at that. And almost 100% of the coverage said that, just parroted her. And it's complete bullshit. That is not what they did. It's a breakthrough, all right? It's a breakthrough in nuclear weapons testing. That's what they did, is figure out a way that maybe through that NIF, since they achieved ignition, they may not have to do nuclear testing again for new warhead designs. They may be able to do it with the NIF. But that's what it was all about. And that was an easy one. I mean, you could have just called up the bulletin's nuclear experts and they would say, yeah, I don't know what Granholm's doing up there. I don't know why they're trying to make it a climate story when it's not. And uh, that, that kind of thing, just by reaching out to experts who aren't tied to the government, uh, there's stories like that fairly regularly. Uh, a couple of just from being a journalist for forever and dealing with scientists and trying to make their prose readable and everything, some like tips. You know, in this sphere, in the nuclear sphere, I don't know whether it's like, I don't know the motivations, but the, the experts often talk in acronyms and jargon and crap, and it's okay, and you're going to have to understand what they're talking about, but don't use the acronym. If it's less recognizable than CIA or FBI, don't use an acronym. I tell my staff, acronyms are tiny poisonous ants that bite readers on the eyes. Don't use them. You don't need them. You can write around them almost 100% of the time. When they talk that way, I mean literally, I explain to the experts when I talk to them, look, we got a lot of general readers. I know what you're saying. I mean, can you try to you know, talk English for smart people, but, you know, like an NPR level audience. What, you know, could you talk at that level for me? And usually they can. And I don't think I have to tell this group this, but, you know, I edit for emphasis. Uh, remember, to have the impact you want, you're not doing a report per se. You're telling stories, narrative. The more you can have characters, scene material, things that draw people in and keep them interested, the important factual stuff will come home that much more clearly than, you know, even the best reported story without that. You know, nuclear affairs is already a pretty daunting thing. Anything you can do to make it I hate to use this word friendlier, you know, make it something that's easier for people to approach is, is worth your time on focusing when you're dealing with nuclear stuff. Okay, and that is the end of all my advice and I will stop acting like some kind of oracle and just talk to you all. Any questions? Alan, yeah. I looked it up. My first article on the bulletin was in the <laughs> Thirty-four years ago, and uh, in 2008, I wrote an article: Twenty Reasons Why Geoengineering Might Be a Bad Idea. And that's gotten a lot of life. But my nuclear winter things, 
the self-assured destruction was 11 years ago. Not many people took it up. So I think if reporters take, the, even though you've got a lot of viewers on your website now, still op opportunities to take articles and, and explain them to readers and expand them because everybody's not going to read the book. Yeah, yeah, I mean, many of you work at, you know, the bulletin has grown quite well, but it's still, I mean, we're a reasonably small nonprofit. Many of you work for organizations that have vastly so more reach. I'm, I'm not going to control it, you know. John, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but, but John's sake, if he doesn't know who you are, I'll tell you. Okay. Um, That's the only rule. I'm Dean nope. Parbas. I'm an editor at NPR. And for what it's worth, I know that Mark Twain would apply for a long time, which is something like I'm not the editor of the newspaper, and I'll try to like, work hard and do so that God will never leave you on. Being an editor <laughs> can be real. But, um, you know, my curiosity about your audience is you mentioned that 70% was under the age of 444. Yeah. Is there a particular area of interest for them? Like, is it the environment? Is it uh, humanitarian? Is it uh, just like, oh my God, like, the, you know, the deployment of weapons? What is, is there an area of interest for them? National security? Uh, we actually just did finished new dashboards that break out for the first time for me and the other heads of departments at the Bulletin, you know, demographics by vertical, like, right, you know, what are the demographics of nuclear, of climate, of whatever. And I actually, this will be the first time I know that, so I, I have to say, I can't actually answer you except by anecdote. By anecdote, probably climate and disruptive tech, that kind of, is probably a little bit younger. But the nuclear space, because we focus so much effort on attracting younger readers to it, is not old fogey land either. It, it really is not. 